of men. Yeah, actually that's going to be Richard Gucci. MIH is going to get you to PubMed. Okay, PubMed.gov, or just Google PubMed. This is where all of the biomedical research peer-reviewed journal articles are indexed on there. So you'll appreciate it. Because when you guys get to nursing school and stuff, I don't know, do you often do reports and stuff on nursing school or anything, or is there more just practical stuff? Not yet. Today. I'll show you two different ways you can search for stuff. Mm -hmm. So this is it right here. Two different ways you can for somebody. Let's think of. Um, you can search by topic. So what's the topic? Um, Bam, this comes up here. All the different things on HIV are you can see in the general search for HIV, and it's going to bring up everything. Do you can get funded doing HIV research? Uh, no. 300,000 journal articles. Uh, <laughs> on HIV, because it came out, that's like the vampire facials. Yes, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. But it's not that. I would, it said it, this comes from the same virus, so yeah, we're trying to see people. that it came from the same place. but. It, isn't there only two HIV viruses? Yeah, but there's different. Um, every HIV virus, because they mutate so much, has slightly different genetic oh, wow. mark, genetic signature, for lack of a better so word. So it has the yeah. same genetic signature. <coughs> so they can actually go back and see if the people who, if they found HIV there, they can actually go back and look at the patients you have now and see if it's the exact same Mutate. isolate. Yeah. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. So they, they know it more like the Yeah, that's the that's the You can actually say yes to the kid because mm -hmm. in the past, let's say somebody claimed they had HIV from you, you could just say, oh, I didn't give it to them, brew it. Now they can brew it. That's all they have to say. I didn't know that sounds like it's only two hours. Yeah, so it's it's, it's different isolates, different So they'll have the same location we're in. So yeah, the genetic code you're gonna have so they'll take it out and they'll sequence it and they'll see how much Variation there is between the, the oh. RNA sequences between the two. Yeah, because they were injecting different things. Yeah, I don't know what, with blood or plasma or something? But it's supposed to be your own. Yeah, yeah well, probably what, but they probably weren't cleaning the needles. That's what they said. So, right. Right. Is that what it was? Yeah, that's, that's what, what they said. It was probably wrong. Yeah. And then you can search by author. How much does the needle cost? I'll just put my name in there. Yeah. And bam. <laughs> so you can search by author or you can search by Is it any? Can you not have So this will give you So if you're looking for particular authors, you can search by author. So if you do author, you do their last name and then their first two initials. If there's somebody if you wanted to topic, just put the topic in. I've had diet right there. Huh. 48,000 articles on high fat diet. Detoxification pathways. What does phase one do again? Bioactivation. It can't lead to bioactivation. It's not supposed to. Um, yeah, the simple one is the cytochrome Q450 system. And it adds a hydroxyl group. And the hydroxyl group does two things. What are they? Makes it more water soluble. Water soluble. Slightly more water soluble and? Makes it Adds an attachment point. Right. Functional group or attachment point. <clears throat> then you go to phase two reactions, and this really, the main part of phase two is to make it incredibly water soluble. So you're adding big sugars to it, these big hydrophilic proteins, 
are these big sulfate groups. The point is, you're going to make this lipid soluble substance now what? Water soluble, so it's going to be excreted in either the urine or the feces. Okay? This will also inactivate a lot of toxins as well. Because you just put this big huge molecule on it that can't interact with its receptor, whatever it's going to be. Phase three. So now that I've got this molecule that I've added this big glutathione to, or this big glucuronide sugar, and it's super water soluble, how am I going to get it out of my cell? It was lipid soluble before, so how did it get into the cell? By becoming water soluble? Huh? By becoming water soluble? Nope. So this, so here's a compound X. Okay, goes into your bloodstream for its pass effect, right? Gets to your hepatocytes in your liver. It's lipid soluble. So what can lipid soluble molecules do? Go inside the cell membrane. They can cross the cell membrane, right? So they're going to get inside of the cell. For the most part, some of the ones need help. Now, though, no matter how it got in, right, if it just crossed the membrane or you were able to move it in somehow through a channel, now it's become a much somewhat larger water-soluble molecule. So no matter what, is it going to be able to simply cross through the membrane? No, right? And you cross the higher concentrations outside the inside, so is it going to want to just diffuse across that membrane, even if you have facilitated? What do y'all think? Are you going to have enough these facilitated channels for each type of molecule? Probably not, right? So how are you going to get it out? <coughs> what do you think? Mm. It depends on how far they want to stretch. <laughs> but not in general, though. Okay. We're going to phosphorylate something. Phase three are those ATP dependent transporters you all talked about. Remember, you want to move against the concentration gradient. If you also want to move something out because it can't get through the membrane, you have these ABC. ATP binding cassette transporters, you have a whole family of them. So what these things do is they're in the cells, membrane, the chemical attaches to it, and it just pumps it out. This is one of the main mechanisms for chemotherapy resistance. Can we go over this a little bit in cancer? Resistance. Resistance? How do you become resistant to chemo drugs? Not you, but how do cancers become resistant to chemo drugs? Here's the cancer cell, here's the blood vessel, right? So the chemo drugs are coming in, right? How do you become resistant? It happens a lot. Blocking it. Receptors. Some of these are pretty little filling is. Permeability. <coughs> hmm? That's the permeability that's Not so much permeability because you're going to be kind of. Might not have changed that much. You have these transporters in your cells all the time. They're called xenobiotic transporters. What did I say xenobiotics are? Anything from the outside. So you have these anyway. And you have a bunch of them that go to the base lateral in your bloodstream. What cancer cells do a lot, it's one of the main mechanisms. They'll start upregulating these, which means they'll start making more and more and more of them. Mm -hmm. So the cancer drug goes in and the cancer drug goes out huh. before it can do its damage. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the main mechanisms for chemotherapy resistance. Because the cancer cells see it as a toxin, right? And the whole point of these things is to get rid of the toxins. They do other stuff too, but one of the things they do is to get rid of the toxins. That's phase three. But right now, um, active transporters are A. BC transporters. Right. <coughs> now, biotransformation or bioactivation. Biotransformation is when you're going to change a molecule and make it less dangerous, right? So you're going to transform it into something that's water soluble, right? 
But what did I say happens every once in a while? Mutation? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. You get what's called bile activation. Uh -huh. In this case, it usually happens up here with the cytochrome P450 system. Bile activation, when they're trying to detoxify something, the cytochrome P450s actually make it much more dangerous and much more reactive. I'm not going to go into a whole thing on electrophiles and nu 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 nucleophiles. <coughs> but what happens here? Hydrolysis reaction, oxidation reaction, I'm not going to worry about it. But in this case, here are the different phases. This is going to be phase what? One, right? So actually you got an epoxide here. But what did you have on here? Here's your R. Let's not look at the epoxide. That causes all kinds of problems right now. What happens right here? Here's R. What did I add to it in phase one? A hydroxyl group, a sulfate group, an amino group. What does they with this? Phase two, what am I going to do to it now? I'm adding this sulfonation, which is this big water soluble sulfate group, or glucuronidation, which is a big giant water soluble sugar, or up here it's called glutathione. You add glutathione to it, and it's going to make this other big water soluble molecule. Now, and you've on inactivated these two. Now what are you going to do with them? Now you're going to transport them out, and they're going to go where? Phase three. Hmm? Phase three in the water cycle. Okay, so here's phase three, which is the transporters, right? So now you're going to take this, transport it into the where? So let's say we're in the liver right now. What are your two choices? Absorb it or flush it. Which one? To absorb it or flush it out. Okay, but what are you going to do? You're trying to get rid of it. The whole, the whole point of this is to metabolize the acid so you can excrete them. So if you're in the cell, the hepatocytes of the liver. It's going to go to the kidneys or? If it is relatively small and very water soluble, it's going to go into the blood. And it's going to go to the kidneys and hopefully get excrete it out that way. If it's too big to get through the glomerulus, or it's not quite as water soluble, it's going to go into the bile and excrete it out through the liver. So when you guys start looking at drugs, I don't know if they do this in pharmacology, who's taking pharmacology? Do they look at any of these, any of these metabolic pathways at all? No. Or no? They don't keep that drug drug interaction. But well, we do talk about like um, like certain like liver, kidneys, <coughs> metabolizing drugs. Okay, so they do talk about some drugs are metabolizing the liver, they mm -hmm. call it some are metabolizing the kidneys. Really means that's where they're excreted most of them. Most of them are metabolizing the liver. So you have some drugs that are mainly excreted in the urine, right? Mm -hmm. And you'll get some excretion in the feces and stuff like that. So you guys will cover this a little bit. I think they should. called the first pass. Huh? The first pass. Well, first, what is the first pass of that? The, to the liver. Everything you eat goes to the liver first, right? How does it get to the liver? Same that vessel. Hepatic, um, <coughs> Hepatic portal veins? Hepatic portal veins. Alright. So xenobiotics talk about bioactivation versus metabolism and biotransformation, right? So in this case, you've got this nice little guy comes down here, your little RH right there, that's your xenobiotic. It comes down to phase one, what happens? Oxidation reduction, cytochrome B450s, you add a hydroxyl group to it. But what can happen? Reactive one. What are ROS? Um, they're not good. <laughs> <laughs> what are ROS? Reactive oxygen species. Oh, no, I, was, I just think it's very radical. No, I don't know what that is. This is what? Free radicals. These aren't guys who want to become communist or anything else. That's not that type of free <laughs> radical. Yeah. These are other free radicals. Electrophiles. These are all highly reactive species of things. In this. So this thing is turning, that may not be too bad, but you still have to get rid of it, right? Otherwise, it'll build up in your system, and accidentally your liver has just made it really, really bad. So you talk about antioxidants and all those things, reactive oxygen species you build up in your body, this is one way you get rid of them, especially the glutathione. Okay. So two different pathways you can go through. You can do this, 
Hopefully it'll just go right down to phase two and then phase three, which is elimination. But if it gets bioactivated, are you done deal? The game over? No. Why not? Hopefully, really quickly, especially your glutathione system, especially this one, the glutathione, it's a very powerful antioxidant that we make. So hopefully, if you do mess this up, your glutathione can attach to it and just detoxify it and eliminate it. That's one pathway. And I'll show you the gap one in a minute. So now you've gotten rid of the hydroxyl group, right? And you've added on what? One of these things. Now, there are a few occasions <clears throat> where you can get reactive conjugation where actually phase two can make them bad. They're not nearly as common as you said there. Remember when I talked about conjugated and unconjugated bilirubin? Someone that sugar attaches to it. Conjugated is when it's been what? It's not a sugar usually, but it's got one of these attached to it. That's conjugated bilirubin. Unconjugated is what? before it goes through this system. So that can tell you where the liver damage is. If you have high unconjugated, that means it's going to be where? Phase one. Either before the liver or the liver's not working well. If it's conjugated only, you're going to build up in the blood, where'd it come from? Probably. Um, so did it come from the liver? Okay, so now it's conjugated now. And it's got to build up. Remember we have pre, intra, and post-hepatic jaundice? If you have all conjugated bilirubin build up in the blood, where is the damage probably? In the blood? Not in the blood. This is just, this is just the bilirubin that's got in the blood. That's going to be post-hepatic, more than likely, because you've already been able to conjugate the bilirubin. So you see how that can tell you, give you an idea of where the damage is based on the conjugation versus unconjugated bilirubin? So if it's conjugated, the, uh, the kidney, no, the liver is <coughs> working. Okay, liver's going to have conjugation. Conjugation reaction right here, right? So bilirubin's made in the liver first, right? Yeah. And then it's going to be conjugated, no matter what. So if, if you have, but you can also have jaundice that comes from just destruction of red blood cells, right? Mm -hmm. So is any of that going to be conjugated? No. No, because it's happened pre-liver, right? Pre-hepatic. Once it gets to the liver, you're supposed to conjugate it, right? So in the liver, you can have either one. You can have different, you know, if this quits working, it's all gonna be what? Unconjugated. Unconjugated, right? If it's working and you have some bile blockage, it could be either one. But if it looks down and all of it is going to be conjugated, which means it's gone all the way through the liver, that's telling you it's gonna be post-hepatic, right? Mm -hmm. See where that makes, see how that works? <laughs> All right, here we go. I'm going to talk to the comments out of you guys. The last thing I did. All right. Uh, this is benzoapyrene. Anybody ever heard of this? It's a combustion byproduct. You get it all the time when you eat or, you know, charcoal foods, things like that. pH is polyamatic hydrocarbons. <coughs> What happens here? <clears throat> Cytochrome P450 system adds a what? So this way you hope it works. And this way it works, everything's going well. It goes to P450, you add a hydroxyl group, but what? You got this f You You ever see this on a thing? This is bad. Okay? <laughs> this little triangle with the oxygen on it. Hopefully what's supposed to happen? You're going to break this apart and make a hydroxyl so you go through the cytochrome P450 and then it gets what? Um, so this is phase one. It gets conjugated through phase two, right? You detoxify and no big problem. What can happen? You go P450 goes here. You get this F oxide, it brings it down here. Now you get this breaking of this way, another P450. Now you get these two hydroxyl groups over here, trans 7, 8, dihydroxy 7, 8, dihydro, benzo, a, pyrene, 9, a, oxide. I'll say that four times fast. <laughs> but what happens here? Binds to the That's always what? That's, that's bad. bad. So that's the cancer you can get from charcoal. 
community only from? What about like like burnt food? Yeah, yeah, and she gets some issue of environmental pollutants and stuff like that. A lot of them burnt food are also what they call PAHs or polyaromatic hydrocarbons. You know, nobody's going to eat you. <laughs> All right, now, one last one. What is APAP? What is acetaminophen? Tylenol. Tylenol. Did we talk about Tylenol toxicity in here yet? Okay, we did. Alright, so let's go through it again. Here's Tylenol. Normally you take Tylenol and it gets what? Hey Pat? Gonna get what? Phase one and phase two, there's a sulfate group. Boom. Take it every day, it goes out right out like it should. Over here, you get glucuronidation, you add that sugar to it, you get the city benefit of glucuronide. Where does it go? Out. Come down here, you get the phenoxyl radical, but hopefully what? This is going to be an antioxidant, so you get glutathione conjugate and get rid of it, right? Mm -hmm. Over here, I'm going to go to this point, you got the reactive oxygen species here. And this one is going to cut down to here. You're going to get what? N-acetyl benzyl semiquinone amine free radical. That's what? Bad. Bad. Go down this way, either here or here, you get what? In the city, yeah. in a BQ, don't worry about that. <laughs> How many of them? You get this one right here. If you have enough glutathione, okay, because this happens no matter what. Every time you take Tylenol, you're going to make some of this. If you have enough glutathione in your system, what happens? Like you get glutathione conjugation. This one actually went this way and then come this way. You get glutathione conjugation and it gets deactivated. It's no big deal. Happens all the time. When you have problems with it, when do you think you might have problems with it? I have problems in the kidney or, or is it something in your liver or kidneys? It's your liver, so if you deplete your glutathione for whatever reason, right? That's when you start having trouble with this stuff. And you can't make it, you can't deactivate it. Okay? When might you have trouble doing that? Yeah. What do they say about alcohol and Tylenol? Okay. Yeah, Especially if you drink a lot. Because if you drink a lot of it, you start, how do you, so what do they say about heavy drinkers? What happens to their tolerance? It goes up. It goes up, right? And the reason the tolerance goes up is they start turning on another detoxification enzyme, cytochrome 2E1, right here, to deal with the alcohol. It's a secondary alcohol, alcohol metabolic pathway to break it down. The problem with CYP 2E1 is it preferentially takes acetaminophen and turns it into that. Mm -hmm. Instead of going this way or this way. So you have more of a chance of that pathway being You start making a lot more of the toxic metabolite. You start making too much of it, you overwhelm your glutathione system. Bad. So the preference is always in either these two, but Well normally you have got a kind of mixture either way here. No matter what. With the normal with the normal um, pathway. But when you upregulate, and the problem is drinking, because you're always going to have to have 2E1 in there, right? But if you drink a lot and you try to break it down, you start making more of this to break down the alcohol, more of this preferentially gives you this metabolite. And so now you start overwhelming your glutathione system, and that's what causes the toxicity. <clears throat> so what would the treatment be for alcohol-induced, a tylenol-induced liver toxicity? Mm-hmm. No, because it's usually already inside them by the time they get there. I mean, they do that too, and they pump the stomach, drink anything that hadn't been absorbed. That could be something that you need it, right? Yeah, they actually get the precursor molecule for this in abundance, so your body starts making a whole bunch of what? Glutathione. Glutathione. It actually works really well if you get to glutathione. All right. Jeez, guys. effect contributed susceptibility of drug-induced liver disease. What does it mean by genetic predisposition? What do you mean by genetic down? What do you think? Think, think, think. Well, 
the alcoholics? Because we've already <coughs> been to alcoholics and that's genetic. Could, yeah, that, but that would be that would be upstream, sort of a non-direct one. What do you think direct genetics might play in this? <coughs> In your DNA. So you've got all these detoxification enzymes, right? That's what we're looking at, right? Drug-induced liver disease. You have about 40 of those P450s and you have a bunch of other stuff and you have a bunch of other secondary ones. What do you think might cause, might genetically cause increased? Like if you don't make, you know, like glutathione, like something like that? Could be that. If you naturally don't make enough of that, that's going to cause it. Some people have um, genetic mutations in their cytochrome P450 systems where they don't work as well, so you can't detoxify drugs as fast. That's a checkpoint, right? Uh, in, in DNA, like it's replication? Or with P450. You think of P53. Yeah, there's a lot of, there's a lot of overlap. <clears throat> Do you guys will come across when it comes to this genetic predisposition is you will see patients that are fast metabolizers or slow metabolizers. Why does that make a difference? Because all drugs get metabolized. They all have to get metabolized. But why is that? So why do you care if you're a fast metabolizer or a slow metabolizer? Because a patient. if it's slow, like you have more risk of toxicity. Good. If they're a slow metabolizer, they could they may have defects. They don't have to use one of the other. P450s doesn't do it as fast. You're going to have to adjust what? Dosing. Dosing. Dosing, right? If you're a fast metabolizer, so you got a patient. Don't, 